Okay, welcome to our pan the panel on postdoc uh, as part of the postdoc research symposium on careers uh, that is going to look at both industry and academia. Um, to get us started, I'm just going to present um, a few slides here. So first of all, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Um, and just as a reminder, set the um, remind postdocs that we have uh, as part of the events uh, later in October, a postdoctoral research symposium on October 15th. And this is a very exciting opportunity for you to share your research. Um, and we greatly encourage you to submit abstracts for it. The abstract is really short. We're doing it in the form of a Twitter post. So it has to be maximum characters of 250. And it's a great way for you to practice your elevator pitch. Um, and if you're only interested in attending and anyone can attend, whether you're a postdoc or not, um, registration is uh, October 8th. Um, and the abstracts are currently due September 29th. Um, so please send us your uh, abstracts. We'd love to see what you're researching. Um, next is as part of Postdoc Appreciation Week, um, we're offering grab a coffee on us. If you go to our Instagram, you can find instructions there on how you can get a, order a free coffee through us. Um, and we would like to uh, celebrate Postdoc Appreciation Week and all the work you get, do by thanking all the amazing postdocs out there. Your research is very important um, and the Postdoc Association and UHN would both like to show our appreciation for the great work that you contribute to the UHN community. And you can have uh, your PIs post appreciation on Twitter or Instagram with the tags that you see here at UHN trainees and at UHN postdocs and some hashtags at the bottom. And we'll see those and share them around. Um, and that's it. So I'm now going to turn us over to um, Michael, who is our one of our wonderful postdocs who's helped plan the events. And Michael will introduce our amazing speakers for today. Thank you, Claire. So we are so pleased to have Dr. Jennifer Campus and Dr. Stanley Cho to talk about the careers in academia and the industry today. So we will have Jennifer to talk first. So um, Jennifer is a um, Canada Research Chair in Multisensory Integration and Aging, the Associate Director and a Senior Scientist and the Kite, um, and also the Associate um, Professor in the University of Toronto. She's also a Director of Kite Young Innovator Youth Outreach Program. Jennifer's background is in psychology, neuroscience, and behavior. She did a PhD in the McMaster University following a postdoc and research team leader in Max Planck, Max Planck Institute in Germany. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation to present today. I really look forward to uh, chatting with everybody. I'm going to just share my screen here. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. Okay. All right, are you able to see that okay? Thumbs up. Okay, so um, yeah, okay. So I uh, thank you so much for the, the introduction. You've actually done some of my job for me in terms of uh, uh, giving some background uh, to my talk, which is about 20 minutes. 
Um, so I'm going to go through things fairly quickly, but I'm really looking forward to the Q&A part at the end. So we're going to encourage you to add your questions to the chat box. It'll be monitored by ORT, and then um, at the end of the session, we'll go through all of the questions. But feel free to put them in there so you don't forget them um, as they occur to you. Um, I'm talking to you today from a couple of perspectives. So one is as the um, academic, the associate director of academics at Kite. And so in, from that perspective, we do a lot of work in professional devel development for postdocs, in, including uh, career trajectories and, and looking at career opportunities. Um, I'm also talking from the perspective of someone who's gone the academic route, obviously. And so I can speak to you about my own experiences um, uh, getting a, a job and starting a, a lab in academia. Um, and also as a member of, of, a, of selection committees. So um, I've served on uh, several selection committees for faculty appointments um, at the University of Toronto. And so I've gone through the process of looking at applicants and, uh, and making assessments and evaluations regarding um, their fit for various faculty positions. Um, and I do come from the perspective of more of a behavioral scientist. So I understand that there may be some discipline uh, specific nuances that you'll want to learn from your mentors. Okay. So I just thought I'd start off with my own career trajectory really quickly. And Michael did a good job of, of summarizing this already. Um, but I, I kind of did a, a basically a traditional route of academia. I want to emphasize, though, that um, I think more and more um, selection committees and evaluation committees for grants and other um, entities are really encouraging non-traditional academic routes. Um, they obviously value the traditional, but, um, but if you've taken some time to go into industry, Industry, or if you've done some uh, practice in, in sort of in clinical spaces, um, then that's also something that's um, that's not uh, that that's seen as as also um, an advantage in different ways. So it's really important to help people understand what your path was and what advantages it serves in getting you to where you are and and what makes you unique actually um, as a potential applicant. So I did do my PhD at McMaster, and then I went off to Germany and I did a postdoctoral fellowship for a couple of years at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics. While I was there, I ended up uh, meeting at a, at a conference that was hosted at the MPI. The Institute Director of Toronto Rehab, uh, formerly uh, now Kite, uh, formerly the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, uh, Jeff Fernie. And, uh, and I can talk about that experience, but I had learned about um, TRI for the first time at that meeting and got really excited about it. Um, and that sort of set my path um, on my way back to the Toronto area. Um, I, I got a faculty or I got a scientist position at Kite to start and followed with an affiliate, uh, affiliate um, position, a status only position at the University of Toronto as an assistant professor. Um, and then I was promoted uh, many years later to a senior scientist and, and you know, a couple of years ago as uh, an associate professor, um, which then uh, led me to be able to um, be generously supported by a Canada Research Chair um, and to take on a leadership position as the Associate Director of Academics. You'll also note that I put a couple of babies in here. So these babies are older now. I have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old, but I do think that, um, that this is a question that some people have in terms of, uh, of balancing career with um, family um, needs and obligations. And I'm always very happy to talk about those experiences as well. Okay, so this is going to be very familiar to a lot of you because I suspect that many of you have already been applying for faculty positions, um, but some of you are might might just be getting uh, into sort of thinking about applying for faculty positions. So when we talk about um, uh, applying for jobs in academia, there are different types of academic jobs. And so when I'm talking about academic jobs, I'm talking about those that might be um, in university departments. Um, we know that there are different streams of, of faculty appointments. Uh, we see more, uh, it's sort of getting more uh, common to see a purely teaching stream where you don't, uh, don't do research or, or one of your uh, sort of uh, priorities um, in your portfolio is, is to mainly focus on teaching. And then there's research stream, uh, which you typically have to do both teaching and uh, conduct research um, with your um, 
evaluations depending on both, but research impact being very important. Um, but it also applies um, in many cases to uh, research institutes that are outside of universities and also research hospitals. And, and that's where I have um, a lot of my experience being at Kite. So typically, and again, this varies depending on the position, but your, the composition of your um, academic um, application is going to include a research proposal, a teaching dossier, a CV, um, representative contribution. So some of your um, publications, for instance, that you think best represent um, your research and, what, and where you want to go. Uh, letters of reference, and then um, if you're fortunate and you get shortlisted, then you um, would be invited to give a job talk. So um, when you're preparing all of these things, it's important to start early. So if you um, haven't started yet applying for faculty positions and you're just kind of getting into that mindset, um, start jotting certain things down. Start organizing your materials early so that these things become easier to write. Um, and, and be open-minded. So for instance, for a teaching dossier, um, we know that it's a little bit more difficult to get teaching experience if you are employed at a research hospital, for instance, at UHN, um, even though they're increasing all of the opportunities for teaching at UHN. Um, but you may have some more opportunities if you're, if you're at the university. But think about this as um, sort of a teaching and mentorship dossier. So of course, put all of your teaching materials in, but also think about whether or not you have um, sort of philosophies and practices and experience in, in mentorship, generally speaking. For your research proposal, you want to create this strategically. So um, some people create the same research proposal and submit it to every faculty appointment or a, a faculty um, a position or job call that there is. And you have to be a little bit careful doing that just because you really want to align um, what your research priorities and your research plans are with where you're applying. And so when you're thinking about, for instance, what kind of infrastructure will be available to you, then you wanna make sure you're very familiar with are, with what's already available at the department, what would be available to you, and what you would need in order to be able to do the research that you're proposing. You also want to create alignment with the department. So you want to look at the job ad and you want to look at the keywords because this is what the selection committee is going to do. The first wave is they're going to say, is this person a good fit for the job call? And so if you can actually pluck the words right out of the job ad as, as they have applied to you, of course, and put them into your uh, cover letter. I didn't write that down. Cover letter is also important and your research proposal. Um, then the alignment with the job ad is gonna become really clear. And so that saves them time looking to sort of find the alignment and to create the links because you've already done that for them. Um, and so you wanna customize. Customizing is really important. So even though the core elements of your research proposal might be the same, um, try your best to, to include some customization so that, um, it's so that it really sort of pops out and, and creates uh, sort of an immediate, immediate and intuitive um, associations with what the people who are reading it are looking for. Um, and you wanna make sure that you're not completely duplicating something that's already in the department. So you don't want to be version two of so-and-so who's already a faculty member in the, in the department. But what you wanna do is you wanna say, here's how I will complement the existing expertise in the department. So you want to really understand what the department is doing so that you can align what you're going to do in a way that's complementary and not duplicating what's already happening in there. Um, and then your CV, I'll talk about this a little bit um, in the next slide, um, but your CV will include all different components that will be uh, important for um, the selection criteria. Representative contributions. So again, these are gonna be publications that you think best represent your work. Um, and you can put some indicators in your research proposal, for instance, that, or in your CV that give indicators of why you think those are really important publications and what impact they've had. Uh, you can, you're can. you gonna wanna choose your letters of reference very wisely. So um, people will often ask the questions, should I get a letter for, from someone who's um, a big name in my field or should I get a, a letter from someone who can write me a good letter? And I think that, um, you know, while both may be important, getting 
a really good letter from someone who really knows you and can provide really specific examples of your impact and of your skills, I think is, is way more important. Um, people who write letters uh, for someone they really know well and really admire write with emotion. And, uh, and a lot of times, if they don't know you well, then they, they write with more of a bean counting approach and that comes across in the letters. Um, but you can really help your, your, um, your referees or your reference um, letter writers help, you can help them write a good letter. So make sure that you're supplying them with everything that they need um, to really pull out those talking points. So remind them of all the accomplishments that you've had, remind them of the contributions you've made uh, if you worked in their lab or in the research area. And, uh, and if there's any alignments that you'd like to create with the job itself, then also provide your letter writers with that information. I'm applying to this department. Here's the specialization. Here's my research proposal. Um, and so if you could highlight some of these points in ways I could complement and what, can, what I can bring to the department, um, that would be really helpful. And then there's the job talk. And so the job talk uh, is great practice um, for you to summarize uh, what it is, all the great things that you've done in your academic career and, uh, and where you plan to go in the future. And it's, it's tricky. It's a, it's a tricky thing to put together because they're usually very short. So you have to, um, you know, not very short, but so they vary between, you know, half an hour to one hour typically. Um, and so you're trying to put a lot of information about everything that you've done and, and the directions you want to go in a short talk. So, um, so it's worth it to spend a lot of time on it. It, practice it a lot, um, practice it in front of a lot of different audiences um, in order to get the right tone and uh, the right content balance. Okay, so in terms of the selection criteria, um, the first thing that I'm going to suggest to you, if you haven't done this already, is to check out the individual development plan. So what this is, is something that's promoted by CIHR and NIH, and, um, and it's an opportunity for you to do a self-inventory of how you're doing on all of these skills that are important in academia. And I put the QR code there so that you can um, scan that or you can just Google individual development plan and CIHR. Um, but it also gives a great opportunity for you to see, you know, what are the criteria for a great academic? So in terms of sort of research ability, mentorship, management skills, um, these are all the types of things that your selection committee is going to be looking for. So the IDP gives you an inventory, a checklist, if you will. And so again, instead of um, forcing your selection committee to search for the ways that you're checking all these boxes of a great academic, you can really spell that out to them and you can use those keywords and you can use those categories and talk about um, how they're relevant to you and your research and what you're doing to achieve these, these goals and skills. Um, and then, of course, the quality of the, the research and proposed research. So I talked about that a lot, but when they read your research proposal, they're going to look to make sure that it seems feasible, that it seems novel, that it seems um, uh, compatible with um, the goals of the department and, of course, also of the job ad. Because when you're building your department or building on your department, um, you're looking to fill different roles because there are gaps there. So you want to make sure that in your research proposal, you're acknowledging what gaps have been um, articulated in the, in the job ad. In terms of your CV, um, you know, they're obviously going to be looking for uh, publications and also quality of the publication. So where it is that you're publishing um, in, in, you know, uh, field specific, um, high impact journals, et cetera, peer reviewed um, presentations at conferences, invited talks, uh, your funding history, awards, uh, any knowledge translation activities that you've been involved with, your community contributions. If you're bringing someone into your department, it would be really wonderful if they've shown some evidence of giving back to the academic community, even locally um, or through reviewing practices or conference organization or whatever it may be. Uh, they'll look for mentorship, obviously, and teaching, um, professional memberships, um, any media um, that you've been, any media, media that has showcased your work in the past. Um, and don't forget leaves and interruptions. Um, it's really important to be transparent about um, 
you know, as you are comfortable about um, any leaves from research because selection committees will take those into consideration. Um, it's part of the mandate. We have to, at least at U of T, we have to go through training, um, you know, with respect to understanding um, issues related to EDI, um, issues related to potential um, interruptions and how that may have impacted research and to, and to um, consider that when we're evaluating all of the other criteria. And there's typically a member of the committee um, who is there from um, perhaps the provost's office who is ensuring that these conversations are being had and that those things are being considered. So don't hesitate to put those things in. And I already mentioned that they're going to look for the fit with the position, the department, the institute. Um, and I briefly mentioned EDI, but this is um, so, so EDI, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at UHN, we have a wonderful idea committee, which includes inclusivity and diversity, equity, and accessibility. And so um, more and more you're seeing um, that uh, for academic positions, you need to include in your materials how you will um, address EDI within your lab um, and within your proposed research. So give that some consideration. Even if it's not asked for, I think that it's something that you should consider including either way. Um, one, because it's very important. Um, it's something that we really need to be considering seriously in research and doing a better job at. Um, but also, I think that it will reflect well, um, because this is an expectation now of funding agencies and, and universities, etc. Okay, so one of the best ways to, um, to find academic positions and to snag academic positions is networking. So if people know you, and if they're familiar with you and they're familiar with your work, you are much lower risk than if, they, if, you're, if you're largely unknown. And, uh, and to, to network well um, is, is sometimes tricky and you have to be strategic. Um, especially now when everything's online, I can fully appreciate that. Um, but it's, it's, it's not just about talking to people and, um, and connecting with people, but I think if you have productive networking, um, and I'll explain what I mean by that, but productive networking whereby you're working towards shared goals or there's some action items that you have to jointly address, the quality of those interactions and your ability to showcase your abilities and what you can bring to the table is really much better um, than just having conversations with people, which are also very good. So I don't want to dismiss that, um, but having productive networking is great. So here are just some examples of ways you could do this. Um, obviously, conference presence, being present at conferences and just name familiarity. Um, if people see you and they recognize your name, it's going to be um, important to see that you kind of uh, attend the same conferences, have shared interests, but also think about like organizing a workshop. So being on the conference organizational committees or being a chair of, um, of a conference, organizing workshops and symposia outside of conferences um, to invite people to share their research and be the one who's really showing leadership in some of these events. But of course, um, you can show leaderships, but you leadership, but you also need to have committees. So you can start to go out and invite people who you'd like to get to know more or work with academically, um, and 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 let them become familiar with you. Um, edit special issues of journals. So um, a lot of journals, you know, publish um, special issues on a certain topic. This is a fantastic opportunity to first get your name associated. Uh, with that topic um, so that this special issue being edited or co-edited by yourself creates that association with that specialization. Um, but again, you can ask other people to co-edit this special issue with you, and then you work together on sort of establishing what the scope of the issue is going to be about the editorial um, you know, uh, details and, and processes. And so that's a really productive way to network with others. And Again, you can do this with people who you don't know personally, but you can say, Dr. So-and-so, I know that you are an expert in this field. I'd like to um, co-edit a special issue. Here's what I'm thinking. Would you like to co-edit with me? 
um, strategically use social media. So I know that there was um, a presentation earlier this week about this, so I won't harp on it too much, but um, I know there are, there are, you know, Twitter has its goods and its bads, um, but I, I've found that a lot of information, um, especially as it relates to available jobs, um, is actually quite, um, Twitter is quite a, quite a good source of, uh, of information when it comes to uh, job postings. And so um, I would just encourage you to think about uh, whether or not you could have like a professional Twitter account. Um, academic Twitter is very um, vibrant and very active. And if you follow strategically certain people, um, then it would help you to become aware of these opportunities, um, especially if there's not sort of a centralized system for which they're posting these jobs, which in some societies there are, um, like some professional societies societies there are and others not so much. So consider that. Um, invite speakers to your department or your institute. Um, have them come in and that's an opportunity for you to talk to them, for them to learn about uh, your research and for you to learn about their research. Participate on committees, um, invite co-investigators on grants or uh, co-investigators or collaborators on a project um, that you're working on that you think they might be interested in. Um, sometimes supervisors forget to introduce you to colleagues in the field. And it is a little bit more, a lot more difficult now, but maybe just remind them and ask them, um, you know, oh, would you mind when we're at this conference introducing me to so-and-so? Or, you know, they're, they have a job, um, they have a job call at this department, at this university. Do you know anybody there that I could talk to? Or is there any insight that you could get into this position or into the department? Or I know they're going to be at this conference. Do you mind introducing me um, at the conference? So you can create that. Um, kind of knowledge and alignment. Um, and don't be shy to ask to speak at departmental talk series, colloquium series. Um, uh, sometimes they have uh, sort of journal clubs. Um, or if you happen to be in an area, if you happen to be, you know, in, you, you know, around, you know, BC and UBC is hiring or you're interested in in, in talking to people because that's a department you'd really be excited to um, be involved with, just ask somebody in the department, say, I'm gonna be in the area. Uh, is there, a, is there a, a, a talk series that I could speak at? Um, or could I come and visit your lab for an hour or so, hear about what you're doing? Again, creating familiarity and showing initiative. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap it up here and I'm just gonna say some, some general tips. So um, it's really like, I don't want to trivialize how difficult and stressful this whole process can be, especially now. Um, and so you just have to maintain your confidence. I put a little comic here because I think a lot of us, including myself, have suffered from uh, impo imposter syndrome. Um, and you don't think that you're good enough or you don't think you have what they're looking for. And you really have to put that aside. You just have to um, be confident in what you have to offer. If you're not getting those positions or those interviews, it's because you're not a good fit, not because you're not good enough. And you just have to remind yourself of that um, and just stay optimistic because it is really easy to become pessimistic, but just stay optimistic and stay confident. Um, determine your priorities. So before you go on the job market, really have a careful conversation with yourself and say, would I really be happy moving to another country um, or, do I need to really think hard about this and say, you know what, I know that's where the jobs are, but I wanna stay in Ontario. Um, and as soon as you get that out of the way, and as soon as you make that decision, then it will, it'll help your strategy much more. And I, I will say that, um, I uh, said that when I was looking for, for um, faculty positions while I was a postdoc, I said, I wanna be in Ontario. That's where my family is, that's where I want to settle. And uh, somebody, actually several people, but one person said it in very colorful terms. They said, you are committing academic suicide by doing that. And in the, at the time, that was very frightening, um, but I had come to the conclusion that I would do something else because the priority for me in that moment was geography. And you just have to think about that. And those priorities will change, but be honest with yourself. Uh, do your homework, as I said, talk to people, talk to the departments, find good mentors. Uh, your supervisors will be great mentors, but you need to find multiple mentors. Um, different mentors fill different, different buckets. Um, sometimes you feel bad asking for things, um, but I know that some very successful candidates 
asked their colleagues or people they know who recently got faculty positions to see their application packages so that they can get a flavor of what they look like and what makes a successful application package. Ask for those things. Um, the worst they can say is no. And chances are somebody gave their application package to that person and they benefited and they wanna pass that along. So again, don't feel afraid to ask. Um, keep an open mind and apply broadly. So just because it says certain things in the job ad that aren't quite the right fit, um, still see what it's about. If you think that there's an opportunity there, just go for it. And then you can learn down the road, whether it's not a good fit for you or for them, but keep an open mind. And with that, I say, keep, uh, feel free to get in touch. I'm happy to answer any questions and I look forward to our discussion at the end. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for the wonderful talk, a lot of uh, useful information. So we're going to uh, have Stanley to talk, and then we have a question and answer session later. So um, Stanley is now actually in San Francisco. We actually want to thank him for getting up super early for this talk. So um, Stanley um, is actually a UH alumnus. He did a PhD in Dr. Matthew Dupin's lab. Uh, his background is uh, cancer uh, epigenetics. And then after his PhD, he joined the uh, um, Arsenal Bio, which is a startup com bio biotech company um, for making CAR T cell therapy in solid tumor. So welcome, Stanley. Thank you uh, for that kind introduction. I'm just gonna share my screen now, um, which, one second, it's not letting me show the slides now after we tested it. There we go, okay. Can you guys see okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for in really inviting me. It's an honor to really give back um, to you at Chen and speak here um, and also it's an honor to really go behind Jennifer. Um, I, I, I have that imposter syndrome right now, really. Um, but uh, I'm not going to speak too broadly about the entire industry, um, just because I don't have that experience. But what I can talk about is really my personal experience uh, since I finished my PhD a year ago and moved out here out west in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so here are my contact information. I will show these again at, later on um, at the end. But i um, happy if you guys want to connect and want to chat about uh, anything afterwards. And so today, really, I just want to go through an introduction of what I uh, have done um, up to this point and really give an idea of, uh, about academia versus industry um, based on my experiences and talk more about uh, the Bay Area a little bit and then just really wrap up with some tips and maybe have a very productive discussion uh, and answer any questions you might have. So uh, to briefly introduce myself, just use a little bit of a timeline. Uh, I, I actually spent about eight to nine years at the U of T um, beginning in 2011 for my bachelor's and then uh, at, uh, at the Princess Margaret as well as the Department of Bio Medical Biophysics. I completed my doctorate uh, under the supervision of Mathieu Lupien um, at the Princess Margaret. And so for about four and a half, five years, I've been at uh, the Princess Margaret Research Tower at, in the Mars building. And then ever since, uh, ever since September, I actually moved out west to, to join Arsenal Bio, which is a very um, innovative CAR-T startup that's uh, led by um, led by quite prominent scientists in the CAR-T field, but as well as uh, Sean Parker, who you might recognize the name from Facebook and uh, Napster. And so this is just a brief picture of what where I work. Uh, I, I am, um, if you've ever been to San Francisco, even if you're not, like I, I work very closely to the airport. And then this dot right here is actually where I'm speaking from. So it's about a 10 minute uh, commute from uh, highway exit to highway exit. And um, this is the tower I work uh, on the seventh floor. So really just go over my uh, background a little bit is that I, I did my doctoral research in cancer epigenetics. I really try to get after the question of understanding uh, how non-coding mutations play functional roles in driving 
uh, aberrant gene expression programs uh, in cancer and really with a specific focus on prostate cancer. And the reason why we study, I study this topic is uh, because the non-coding DNA actually is about 98.5% of our human genome, but we barely know anything about it. And the really important thing about non-coding DNA is that while it does not translate for functional proteins, it has a lot of regulatory elements that uh, regulate the gene expression um, of these uh, proteins that gets translated uh, through three-dimensional space uh, in the genome, in the wiring. And so these uh, pictures are just uh, two different timestamps of the Lupian lab when I uh, joined when I was early on, and then later on, uh, how the group has transformed over time. Um, so really academia versus industry, just right, get right into it. Um, again, the, the really important caveat here is this is based on my experiences so far. And, and these academia bullet points are not necessarily uh, tra uh, translating to exactly what PIs go through as Jennifer herself is. So please do correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I've observed. And this is my experiences through uh, doing uh, academic PhD versus a industry startup that's not going to be on the next slide but the I, I want to make a key point here is that industry goes far and beyond uh, just biotech startup as you, you guys know there's like big pharma there's also other industries like consulting people go into but today I'm going to just focus on my experiences uh, working at a biotech startup and really going through academia first uh, the, the projects in general and the projects that uh, PIs um, uh, organize is, is really a lot of it is curiosity driven. And uh, what I find is that the, these projects and to nobody's surprise in academia, they're more open ended and they're open minded. And uh, although a lot of that really depends on grant success, because at the end of the day, grant money sort of dictates what you can do. And the goal is really centered around delivering high impact papers that contribute to the field academically so that other people can get inspired from those ideas and, and, and really further advance the field. But in terms of academia, you are working relatively more in isolation. I'll speak to that in the industry setting where individual achievements, whether you're a grad student or a postdoc, or then later uh, as a PI, your, your achievements really set up your road to success promotions, so uh, more grant money, so on and so forth. And uh, in academia, resources, not uh, obviously depending lab to lab, um, resources can be very limited. It depends on your outside collaborators, depending on grant success. And, but one thing that I will say that I really enjoyed about academia and that doesn't talk get talked about enough is there's in general less office politics and you don't have to play the game. Uh, because there's just in general less people you come across and have to work with. And this uh, is actually quite understated of a point because if you ever enter industry, you realize that you have to really watch your tongue and, and really um, see where you step sometimes. Um, and then I talk about job stability. Uh, if I understand graduate students will be there for years, um, postdocs the same. A PI a ship, it, you, you might be paid by the university and your job is relatively stable as long as you have grant money, in which uh, I'll speak to in industry is not necessarily the same. And that uh, with external presentations, you, you, you can more freely communicate with your field, uh, your, your colleagues in the field, travel to conferences, present your data from your lab, present your data from your per per like personal research as a trainee. Um, and that is uh, something that academia has in which um, an industry, it's not seen as much. And the one last thing, and it's, it should be no surprise to you guys, uh, the compensation and earning potential. I'm not talking about just on a salary basis, but I'm talking about as a career, uh, academia in general is uh, relatively lower than industry. And so here is a really a little bit... Um, different. It's not necessarily a one-to-one -one, uh, comparison uh, between the, the former slide and this slide, but rather just uh, some bullet points that I, I wanted to touch upon. And this list is not exhaustive, um, but just want to get you guys something to think about so that you, you have that uh, idea of what uh, working in a biotech startup and maybe some of these points uh, 
are, are very translatable to other industries like big pharma. And so in, 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 in industry, deadlines are deadlines. There's no, um, I'll, I'll just push back another week before we submit this paper after review. Like companies like Arsenal, for instance, where I'm at, we burn millions of dollars every month trying to produce as much data as possible. And we're burning investor money. And so in that case, um, we are not exactly equipped to not deliver. And there's, and when we say this is a deadline, it's a drop dead date. So certain experiments, certain key results needs to be delivered by a specific date or the project dies uh, or you have to move on or you get a lot of pressure. So uh, deadlines are definitely deadlines. Uh, when, I, when I mentioned that, excuse me here. Oh, whoops. And note taking and documentation is inevitable. Uh, this, is in, uh, this is a point where it, it really depends in academia where what, what kind of a note taker you are because uh, I, I, for one, like had to up my note taking game ever since I moved to industry because in academia, I used to take notes, but I don't write down all the catalog numbers. I don't write down all the, all the lot numbers. I don't repeat write notes if I'm doing something repetitively but it is super important to document everything uh, in your notebook um, in, in industry because all the timestamps matter, all the details matter, it needs to be reproducible. Uh, it's important for IP, it's important for robustness because eventually if you're in a, a biotech or pharma, you're, the, the, the goal is to really deliver a drug that will go into clinical trials and be reviewed by the FDA. And I talked a little bit about uh, working in isolation back in the former slide in academia. In, and the reason why I said that is because in industry, relatively speaking, collaboration is key, especially in a startup. And you're surrounded by brilliant, brilliant scientists where other people come from very famed institutions, especially at, uh, at a really good startup. And, the, and the, the difference I find is that ego does not play a role in, in this kind of setting because you actually need a team to work as a team and collaborate to succeed. Um, this is because if you work as an individual, as I mentioned, going back to point one here where companies burn millions of dollars every month, if, if everybody plays as an individual, the company will fail with, without question. And so that's, a, I, I cannot emphasize collaboration is key enough. So teamwork is a very important skill that they look for in, in your interviews. And this is sort of uh, related to point three, robustness and reproducibility. Again, the goal is not to deliver a paper. The goal is to put a drug in a patient who needs our help as soon as possible. And as our um, CEO at Arsenal always, uh, Ken Drazen always says, we need to work quickly because the patients are waiting. And then another point is the structured employee progress review. Uh, this, I, I'm not sure how often it is done at the PI level, but as a trainee, it varies lab to lab. Uh, but uh, in, in the industry setting, from what I've experienced, expect feedback and a lot of feedback. And you gotta be okay with accepting the feedback without being defensive. At the end of the day, it's really trying to help you grow. And so it can be painful to hear your shortcomings, but I can tell you that um, I learned a ton from hearing from my manager and others during my review process where uh, a lot of, uh, flaws that was that was pointed out to me, I, I managed to fix them up in the, in the following months. And another thing is that the experiments and projects are done at scale. And I'm gonna go over this a little bit when I talk about a typical day in my life right now. But uh, for, for me, every week I deal with, uh, a, a single day I would deal with doing four to five, 384 QPCR plates or uh, screen 40 to 50 different constructs uh, to, to, really un to really give you an understanding of what I mean by scale. A lot of this work is assisted by semi-automated uh, robots and very rarely uh, we use a single, pi a single channel pipette and we really don't even enjoy using a multi-channel pipette because at times that's way too low throughput for us. So very different in academia because everything is about scale, everything is about speed, Really all this ties back to point number one, companies burning millions of dollars each month. So you have to deliver. But one thing that they really do care about, and I'm not sure if academia worries as much about is about employee retention, because especially in the Bay Area where there's a lot of competitors around, 
uh, we want to keep our employees happy. And, and that really is about career advancement. That is about benefits, salary, et cetera, et cetera. They really worry about work culture and making sure that you are happy uh, because they want to keep you if you're doing your job. If they lose you to another car, t- in my case, in, uh, if they lose me to another car t- ther- therapy company, uh, they not only that the company loses, but I have the intelligence to go over to my, uh, the new company and work there. And, 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 and so it's like a double whammy. And so really, I want to debunk some popular myths and rumors about industry based on my experiences so far. Um, really speaking a little bit to also what Jennifer has talked about. Um, if one of the popular ones is that if I cannot get a PI position, I will just go into industry thinking industry is a backup. Um, and, and really tied to that is also, well, I'm going to go into industry because I don't want to be a PI. That also I hear about a lot. Um, what I will say to that is that, especially in the Bay Area, it's actually very challenging to land a competitive industry position. Um, I actually asked my manager afterwards uh, for about my interview process and how long it took him to hire. Um, I think he went through about 200 to 250 resumes uh, before screening another few tens and landed on me joining the company. Um, so just know that it's actually very challenging to land a competitive industry position, especially now that there's a boom in biotech. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's challenges for sure, and you need to stand out. And so uh, for a lot of people as well, being industry is their first choice. And, and so please do not really think that, you know, I, I just, if, if I cannot get a faculty position, I'll just enter industry. It's, it's not as simple as it, it sounds. And I have numerous colleagues in the company that had faculty offers, but instead chose industry. Or I had actually have friends here now that was faculty, for instance. Um, funny enough, she was also in psychiatry. Uh, as, a, as a PI at Emory, uh, but then she, and over time she realized that it's just not worth it and chose industry and she's a lot happier that way. Um, another one that I want to uh, debunk is really industry research is not innovative. Uh, it's, it's boring. It's repetitive. Sorry, I really messed up the grammar there. Uh, but really, it's, it's really not, especially in my experiences in a biotech startup setting, because there's different departments of working. But at a startup, you kind of touch everything. And we have our, for instance, at Arsenal, we have a next gen R&D department, really does a lot of CRISPR screens, does a lot of pooled screens, does a lot of innovative research that really feeds into future products that are important for us. Uh, and, and maybe a weird analogy, and, and, and please do let me know if you really disagree. Um, we aren't really innovating really in the sense of inventing the first car ever, but we're trying to be innovative and trying to turn a Honda Civic into a Ferrari, right? So really we're trying to innovate and and improve based on what's existing, uh, but we're not really trying to come with a brand new idea. And uh, the next one is really industry hours are easy and the pressure is low. Maybe in big pharma, because I've heard that too, but in a startup setting, you're really trying to claw and survive because again, you're uh, you're, you're, you're burning a lot of money uh, every month without... Uh, significant revenue, uh, revenue. So your profitability is low, and your runway, as we call it, it, it is limited uh, based on investors' uh, cash. And so the pressure is very high to deliver, and there is a lot of stress to deliver. Um, and and it really feels like every experiment you do is very very critical. And in a sense, sometimes you you get the feeling that you cannot fail. Um, Lastly, another myth, and there's more, not an exhaustive list, is I don't want to just be a cog in the machine. And this may be true, again, in a big pharmaceutical company, but in a biotech startup, there's actually a lot of room for growth and to be able to contribute beyond your job description. And so from my experience, I, I, I really was interested in uh, doing business development um, based on how to develop a scientific idea into, uh, the, the, uh, uh, like into a business idea. And right now I'm able to get mentorship and meet with our company CFO as well as our CEO to really see how they are thinking about uh, doing that and, and game planning for the future. So that you don't really get a lot of um, exposure to in the pharma, uh, but uh, for me, I'm able to really try and reach out and, and talk to whoever I wanna to talk to at this current size 
um, to, to really learn as much as I can. And so this is a typical day for me. Um, uh, here, let's focus on the left here. Uh, I realized that a lot of people that I, I've surveyed want to know what a typical day is for me, not just here, but I also survey my friends in other institutions as postdocs. So I really start my day with a half an hour to an hour prep in the morning to really game plan my experiments, order reagents, thinking ahead. And on average a day, I have about two hours of meetings, whether these are team meetings, uh, meeting with a collaborator outside of my department, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings or experimental meetings. And then I am in the lab for about six to seven hours doing all sorts of stuff, cell culture, flow cytometry, qPCR screens, and then once I get home, I still do another one to three hours of nighttime work to, to backfill notes, again, to keep notes uh, robust, uh, planning ahead, uh, meeting preparations for the next day, slide decks like this one, for instance. Um, but, but most importantly, what I find compared to academia is that you really have to be flexible because your day that you plan out can change dramatically on a dime, uh, depending on what um, others want out of you from above. Uh, on the right here, this was actually my day three days ago. Um, and so you can see I started at eight and I didn't really get home until eight. And then actually I went on uh, to really uh, prepare and do notes until 11. And so really lastly, I wanna talk about the academic path. Uh, I, I was on the academic path until three months before my defense. And, and, and uh, I had all of the stuff that Jennifer talked about, I had impactful publications, I had awards, I, I presented a numerous, uh, uh, not numerous, but a number of uh, international conferences. I had world-class fellowship offers at the Dana-Farber UCSF here. So why did I switch away from the academic path? And really it's because of COVID and COVID during the three months, it, it, I, I stayed at home. I picked up running as a hobby. Uh, I played a lot of computer games. I, I wrote a review. I authored on a chapter for, for the basic science of oncology that's published from UHN uh, PPIs. I wrapped up my thesis. I defended my PhD. So, so what else I had was a lot of time on my hands to think really. And I want to emphasize this. You really need to think because we are, we are living in a world of like going a hundred miles per hour, uh, 100 miles per hour. And, and really you need to think about what your options are. Am I being too restrictive with my options? What do my family want? What, what do my friends want? But really I asked myself, what do I want? Because I've always done in favor of what others want. I really need to think about what do I want? And am I really happy if I left science? All these sort of questions like Jennifer talked about, if I want to move, if I don't want to move, um, so really, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. Think about this. And the Bay Area, I just want to close up quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, this meant to say hanging around, but uh, we hang around 15 to 25 degrees Celsius all year round with minimal precipitation. And the reason why I mentioned that is because it's actually a huge reason why people like it here and you want to move here because the weather is nice, the culture is nice. And you get that I've made it feeling because everybody around here is so smart come from famed institutions, um, uh, even in tech, you know, you go work for Facebook, go work for Google, so, uh, so on and so forth. They, 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 they get that I've made a feeling and I've got it too when I came here. And of course, there's a big uh, tech hub, big tech biotech hub, big pharmaceutical hub, because for instance, Genentech is right across the street from where I work, where they're headquartered. And they have offices for AbV, Amgen, AstraZeneca, they're all here. And many people working here aren't originally from here. Uh, you got to realize a lot of people who are educated, they all cluster in the Bay Area, but they're not necessarily from here. So you make friends just because you work with them because they don't have friends here either. And once you get in, it's a smaller community than you think. A lot of Arsenal folks, uh, they actually met from other companies and they network to get this job. And again, like I talked about, very fast paced and obviously very high cost of living. I, I live with my girlfriend. And we have a two bedroom apartment and I can tell you, we pay $6,000 in rent every month between the two of us. So it's very high cost of living. But lastly, the boom of biotech, just really general trend. This is taken from JP Morgan. You can see that over the years, you see more and more biotech companies at different rounds of R&D partnership, mergers, sales, venture rounds, IPO. Like you can see this uh, trend of increasing biotechs coming up year after year. 
And here you can see that in the, in the private setting, you see increase in cash year over year for different rounds uh, of uh, investors just throwing money into the, the companies, especially looking at 2020 during the COVID year even, you see that this Series D year, there's a lot of money going into uh, industry. And, and here from Biopharma Dive, what I want to focus on is the, just this top left corner here. It's, it's the amount of companies at the certain number of cash that is raised through an initial public offering. You can see it from right to left, year after year, you have a lot more companies going public. And in 2021, we're already at 67, whereas in 2020, there was only 71. And the year before that, even less companies going public. And this cash is going higher and higher. So there's a lot of boom um, that is in biotech. And so here are a few tips for uh, if you're trying to interest in again the industry, it is very possible to switch fields. So be open-minded, update your LinkedIn profile network, research gate, Google scholars aren't enough. Change your CV into resume because in, in, in resume in, in the industry, they don't look at your CV. It's too long. Keep it two pages max. I, I promise you, you can do it. Don't just list your experiences, but really on your bullet points, really focus on what is the impact of that experience. And this takes iteration. Please do start early. It took me two months to write mine when it, before I started applying and ask others to edit. Your resume is just the first step into the door. After that, please perform. Some companies do require job talks. And when you're actually in this phase of negotiating, salary matters, but equity matters a lot more. So please negotiate. Just really think about this, okay? If you're at a startup company and you're offered the option to buy 30,000 shares of that company stock, for one dollar each over four years, you get thirty thousand dollars, thirty thousand shares. What if your company then later files for an initial public offering and gets traded at thirty dollars, a thirty-one dollars per share? Here, you're basically making thirty dollar profit on thirty thousand dollars, a thirty thousand shares. So, of course, risks are involved. Company A here is Moderna, where they went through this curve, going from less than hundred dollars, well less than hundred dollars, into four hundred and forty dollars per share. Or you can be in a company like Zymergen, which went from $40 a share when they IPO earlier this year down to now $13 a share. So all of this is about equity, not just your salary. And so my interview process, it took about 49 days. Really, you're, you're getting your cover letter and your resume submitted. You have a notice of phone interview 10 days in, and then you have a phone interview screen two days later. I had a notice of... Uh, interview panel about another four days later. A week later, I had first round of interviews with five uh, senior scientists and directors. Second round was three scientists and RAs, reference checks, uh, interview with the CSO at the time, and then later ended with a phone interview with the CEO. And then uh, this entire process really took about 49 days. So it does take a while. And you can imagine if you're applying to multiple companies, you have to really strategize how you're gonna interview with both places. Take home, there are a lot of misconceptions about going to industry, so make sure you do your homework. Uh, working at a big pharma and biotech startup, uh, very different. Make sure you do your homework. Time is precious. You cannot bring back lost time. So if you're interested in making the move, do your research and do it. Like, don't just wait around thinking that your project will work out. If you actually want to move, move. Time flies, honestly. It, it does not really wait around. What I learned in one year in industry, uh, I realized that produced a lot more than I did in my five years in, as a PhD student. And working a resume early, it's not all perfect though. It's, it's been really hard. I have elderly, elderly parents back home. I've moved during a pandemic. I learned immunology on the fly. So I felt like I was doing a PhD on top of delivering on a PhD level job. So the pressure is really high. And think about your options, really think about it. Take time to really evaluate. And lastly, just reach out to me, happy to chat and set up a call anytime. So ask me anything. Um, I have time. I, I know that this is like about to end, but I have time if we can stay on. Um, so this is my Twitter and this is my LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stanley. So we probably have a really quick question. So um, probably uh, the question about for Jennifer. So you mentioned you have two babies where you're building your academic career. So can you speak a bit more, more about how did you manage to find a good balance between uh, the increasing responsibilities of motherhood and the needs of your career and work? I think it's a really, really relevant uh, question for many female researchers. 
Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, there's, I think it's, there's not a really great answer because it so it's so much determined by your personal set of circumstances. But what I can tell you is that um, I went into it uh, consulting with a lot of people and asking them, when is the best time to have kids? Because it was a priority for me. It's not a priority for everybody. Um, so I had some people say, you know, have your kids in graduate school because you don't have all of those different pressures. You have some flexibility. You can step away and come back a little bit more easily. Same thing during a postdoc. You're not applying for funding. You, you know, you and some people said, just wait until you get your tenure track position and you have job security. And so I got all of the answers um, and I had kind of thought about it and, and I thought, OK, maybe postdoc seems like a good time. And of course, nature disagreed with that. And we had some serious fertility problems and shifted everything forward to a time that I wouldn't have selected voluntarily and it worked out just fine. So I guess the message here is that it is difficult to balance, um, but you can't control it. Um, you just have to decide again what your priorities are and try to maintain them. So I do secure time in my day. Um, you know, it wasn't always uh, possible to do this, but but now I really chunk my time. I put a, a big um, block in my calendar um, at the end of the day when I have to go pick up my kids, when I have to go drop off my kids. Um, and uh, I try to uh, sort of reserve one day of the week um, that I block out from any meetings so that I can focus on writing and concentrated work so that I can get that done before I enter into the weekend. So I think you just have to find what strategy works for you and it won't be the same strategy that works for everybody, but that's been my experience. Well, thank you. Thank you. Good to know. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. So um, I think uh, Stanley have a lot of information, so I'll co probably cover a lot of uh, questions already. Um, so a quick one is that in Central, you have a good publication that occurs if you want to go to industry and what skills in one's resume to be part of the industry. Yeah, I, I do think that there's a misconception that your your publication record does not matter. Um, that's why also I think why a lot of people think that if I cannot get a PI position, I'll just go into industry. I can tell you for a fact that your resume does matter. And it's the first thing that people look at before even giving you a chance um, to interview. So I, I, I talked to my manager as well that when I first joined, um, like what stood out? Like why why did you hire me? Because I was very curious so that I can give back um, to a community like this. It's the first thing is it, your your CV stood out, like your resume stood out because you have all the skills, you have the publications. So I and they and especially at startups, they they rather invest in your potential than what your skill set is technically, um, because they want especially at a PhD and postdoc level, they, they want somebody who can think and innovate and not just do the bench work all the time because they hire research associates to do a lot of that hands-on work. And I still do a lot as a junior scientist, but uh, eventually they wanna grow you and mold you into somebody who's more on the um, innovation of ideas um, role as opposed to just always doing bench work. So I will say that your, your publication record is a huge advocate for that. So it does matter. And I can tell you for a fact that I have a lot of colleagues who are who join out of grad school and they all have nature papers, science papers, cell papers. And that's not to necessarily scare you. Not everybody needs that. But I want to tell you that these people have these papers and realize industry is where I want to be. And those are the people that you need to compete with. Thanks, Penny. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, it's actually asking a similar topic, which is teaching. Um, usually, we don't know much about that. So, for example, when apply for teaching stream, if the research says they're important, do they still ask you to give a talk about it? And how open, uh, considering our hiring committee towards advanced degree candidates with our, like with with no teaching experience, and uh, how can one navigate? writing statement for teaching teaching philosophy with very little classroom teaching experience. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so there's a lot of questions in there about teaching. Um, so again, all, all positions will be different, but my experience with teaching stream positions is that um, 
while they may again look at your CV to see um, you know how your contributions in the areas of like scientific communication and publication uh, could um, have some some bearing on uh, the extent to which you're qualified for the position, um, they don't often ask you to give a scientific talk. Instead, what they often ask you to do is give a sample lecture. So they may either assign you the topic or just ask you to speak on anything that is curriculum relevant to the teaching uh, stream position that you're applying for and uh, prepare a lecture and, and give that as your job talk instead. Um, uh, but again, those, those things differ. And then the question about um, about what to do when you don't have a lot of teaching experience. So the first thing is, and of course this all depends on timing, but if you can build your teaching experience, that's always going to be the best option. Um, it's not always a possible option, but um, you don't have to rely on uh, necessarily getting um, lectureships at universities. So I see that Amanda had put something in the chat box about the opportunities that UHN um, and ORT in particular is creating to allow uh, postdocs at UHN to get more teaching experience. And, and part of that comes from the potential to develop a course um, that would be offered through UHN and, and come up with the curriculum. Um, but it could also be sort of through more informal mechanisms. So um, offer to serve as a guest lecturer um, at the university. So if you know people um, in the department or if your supervisor has a cross appointment to certain departments at U of T, um, you can see what course offerings there are and, and get in, in touch with the instructors and, and offer. They're usually very happy to have someone very experienced give a guest lecture. Um, and I do that actually quite frequently um, for graduate courses or undergraduate courses um, and or give uh, sort of mentorship geared presentations at your institute or beyond. So so all so in that case, try to build up your uh, teaching CV as much as possible. Um, but if you can't do that or you know you're kind of in the application process right now, um, then just remember that it's not just about classroom teaching. If you haven't done much of that, then talk about mentorship. So my dossier, even when I went up for a promotion at the university, um, I hadn't done a lot of classroom teaching um, at that time. So I talked a lot about about all of the different mentorship activities that I had been involved with. It also includes a philosophy. So, um, you know, usually you put your teaching philosophy in there. So even if you haven't had teaching experience, you still have to express what your teaching philosophy is. So you have to think carefully about when you do get in the classroom, uh, how you're going to structure that and how you're going to prioritize that. So there's different components to it and it's not all based on experience. That sounds really good. Um, a bit of one for Stanley. So how do you answer the employee, uh, employer worries about the fact that a PhD couldn't be adapted for in a startup or company environment because the person doesn't have any experience in the industry and what are the processes? And what is the risk to step back and be hired as engineer rather than a higher position expected with PhD? What is a good balance between years in postdoc to be an expert at the time to join the industry? Yeah, uh, I think that's a lot of questions. So I'm trying to take them one at a time. Um, I think the adaptability is um, more and more PhDs and postdocs are joining industry. So I think employers, especially out here in the Bay Area, they, they acknowledge that. And, and I, I can tell you for a fact that my manager it came out of his PhD and then worked only for one year in industry prior to his role. And he admits that he doesn't have a lot of managerial skills. And so these things you develop and employers realize you need to develop them over time. Um, so I don't think that the adaptability issue is what it used to be. Um, I think that they expect you to adapt over time as opposed to right away. And as long as, again, you have great ideas and you are very innovative in selling yourself to the company that they will give you a chance for sure. I, I don't think that people uh, they worry as much about the adaptability issue. Um, I will say that um, it took me time to adapt simply because I was really thinking, you know, I was the guy back in grad school in my program, like publications, all, all that. And then I got dumped into this new environment. I was like, wow, I am actually so dumb. So 
these things, you just have to realize that the imposter syndrome and, and all that that we talk about, it, it will happen. And it, it's really important to keep yourself afloat, realizing that it's a new environment and you need time to learn and adapt and your employer will give you time to do that. Um, in terms of the risk of stepping backwards of being hired as an engineer, um, it, I, don't, I don't necessarily think there's a risk. It's more about what you want. I have a lot of colleagues that came in into the company as scientists, but as we expanded, um, there are more roles open on the managerial side and they realize, oh, I wanna be a project manager. I wanna be a program manager uh, because that's more fitting for my lifestyle and my family. And you can absolutely pivot. Um, so there's no necessarily risk. It's more about thinking about what you want and what the, what's the path that you want to go on uh, as you progress. So I, I don't think that's necessarily a risk of saying, I have a PhD, should I really like lower myself? Um, we don't really think that way. Um, we, we think about who can do the job. I don't know if I missed a question in there, but please do let me know if I did. Yes, I think uh, it's also asking that, uh, what's the good balance between the years in postdoc to become an expert and the time to join industry? I think it's a question of asking, like if you're also doing the postdoc, um, how do you balance the time if you wanna do postdoc first and then you wanna join the industry later? Uh, realize where you're at in your postdoc is very important. Don't lie to yourself. Um, I have a friend that had a first author cell paper in his PhD at U of T and then came to UCSF for his postdoc at a very famed prostate cancer lab, uh, which is the lab that I was supposed to join too before I changed. But he did two years, did a lot of CRISPR screens, very brilliant ideas, but realized it's not working out. And so he can either restart all his CRISPR screens again or just realize you know what, maybe this is not right for me. And so he took the time to reevaluate and he recently just joined industry in a company called Senti Biosciences and he loves it. So I would say that try out the idea you really wanna try out and if you wanna do a postdoc and pursue a postdoc, but once you try it out and it's not working out, it's very important to realize that the, the time is precious because when we talk about that, your earning potential matters. So when I talk about startup environment, when I talk about equity, two years you can invest. So back to the example, quick example I gave, two years you can invest, say 15,000 shares at that example I gave, 15,000 shares for $30 difference is $450,000 on top of your salary. So that's how people and startups here think. They don't think about salary bands. They think about what is my earning potential if my company goes public? And so you have to think that way. You, you, you can't just think, it's okay. I'm gonna get a nature paper in two more years if I spent two more years. The nature paper, you have to reevaluate whether that's worth $450,000 for you. So like it, it, you have to think in a different mindset. Uh, that's amazing. Thank you both. Just to wrap up uh, and general question for both of you, what do you feel that they are the three most important skills for your field? Uh, that postdocs and graduate students ha can have in their minds in order to focus on their career path that they want to follow? You can go first, Jennifer. <laughs> oh, that's really hard. I mean, I do, I do think networking, so like your networking skills and your networking potential is really going to be a huge asset for you um, because it is it's going to make you aware of the opportunities, but it's also going to open up the opportunities for you. But of course, once you have that foot in the door, then you have to deliver. And, um, and uh, as much as we don't like to think about bean counting, um, when all people have to rely on is the materials that they're looking at, um, then publications are obviously really important. So not just quantity, but qualities and expressing why there is quality um, and all of those other credentials that are going to be apparent on your CV, um, including you know, awards beget awards. So if you're not applying for awards, apply for awards, even if they have no monetary value, um, because as your awards add up, even if they're honorary, um, that will get you more awards because people will look at your CV and see 
see that you're um, an award-winning researcher and they want to give more awards to award-winning researchers. So um, I think those kinds of, you know, sort of that's kind of the academic currency. It's the, it's the publication, it's the awards, it's the funding, it's those recognitions that are going to be really important um, among your, your peers, because your peers are the ones who are evalu evaluating the quality of your work for the most part. Um, so networking and sort of the sort of the, the the main academic currency that comes from your CV, and then the third part, the third most important, I think maybe those two bundled a whole bunch together. So that's probably sufficient. But um, but I think of course the um, you know the extent to which like eventually um, what I like to say is that when you do get your own lab and therefore when you're applying to become a PI, you become um, a small business owner. And that sounds very strange because we're not in business per se, but all of a sudden you're launched into being, you know, someone who's in HR because you have to bring in hiring and RAs and, and your graduate students and your postdocs. Uh, you have to become an accountant and you have to get some experience in finance. Uh, you have to be a project manager uh, in addition to all of the actual things that you're getting, you know, that you're being paid for and that you're being hired for, which is the research itself. So if you think of yourself as a small business owner that has all of these different moving parts and you're going to have to develop develop all of those different skills in order to keep that engine running, um, then thinking strategically about being that small business owner and how you how you will manage all of those things, I think is also going to be really important. So putting on that hat will help you in preparing your materials, um, responding during job talks, especially when you're consulted about um, startup funds and things like that. How are you going to manage those? Um, you're going to be asked to think about things that you haven't yet, for many of you, have not been asked to think about. So I think um, that's another uh, another sort of strategy that you want to prioritize. Yeah, I think for my stuff, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is really networking. As um, Jennifer talked about, you, you really need to know, know how to network productively. Um, and so that's definitely a skill you have to have. Um, because once you get into industry, it's so easy to go from job to job. The hardest part is the first job. But once you get in, recruiters reach out to you. I get recruiter messages on LinkedIn every other day. But before you get your first job and letting people know that, oh, I have that experience, they, they, don't, they won't contact you. So to get that first job, a lot of it has to do with networking and really understanding who's, who's in what positions and how they can help you. And obviously do that in a genuine way. Don't just you know, take their advice and never talk to them ever again. Um, and then another one is definitely communications. Um, we got to remember, as I mentioned, collaboration is so key in industry, especially in the startup setting. You, you need to be able to be a team player and, and collaborate. And we have fired people in the past year that are too individualized because they don't, people don't work well with them at all. Um, and, and nothing is worse at a startup than really disrupting the chemistry of the team. So you need to be a team player and it's not about your individual achievements because a lot of times you won't get credit for everything you do, but you will enjoy the, the success and happiness when your company succeeds as a whole. Um, the third one is you got to, one thing that I'm trying to learn actively is risk mitigation. Um, everything is about risk mitigation. Everything is about if the primary strategy does not work, what is your backup plan? And you need to think that well ahead of time. It's not about, you know, in academia where it's more about, well, if this experiment doesn't work out, maybe I could try this. No, like management in companies, again, spend millions of dollars every month. They want to know before you even start, what is your backup strategy? So if you're, because they need one. Um, and if it doesn't, if you don't have a backup strategy, why are we doing this? Because it's so risky. So a lot of the terms we use is we're operating at risk. We're operating at risk. What is your risk mitigation? What's the timeline for the risk mitigation? How much does it extend? So it, it, it's really about a different mindset in that sense. And so being able to learn how to risk mitigate in your project would be a good skill to have. Okay, well, thank you both so much for uh, 
that for coming and, and speaking to us. There were a lot of great questions. For those who still have questions, I'm sure Jennifer and Stanley would be happy to uh, take them if you contact them. Um, and this video will be available later if you need to review it. Um, we'll probably by tomorrow have it up. Um, and thank you all for attending. And uh, again, Jennifer and Stanley, we really appreciate you coming and delivering these great talks. Thank you. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.